Okay, so we're back for uh, part two of the uh, TAVR lecture. Um, and so now we're going to go a little bit into TAVR analysis. Um, so first I want to start just, just touching on what is normal aortic valve anatomy, and uh, especially talk about the anatomy relevant to uh, the measurements that we're going to do for uh, TAVR planning. Uh, this is a picture of the normal aortic valve uh, in systole on the left, diastole on the right. You see the nice tri-leaflet appearance and the triangular-shaped opening of the aortic valve orifice on the left-sided image. Um, upper right-hand corner, you have reference here from an um, uh, oblique sagittal image, kind of a three-chamber view image of the heart, showing you exactly where we are. We're just above the aortic valve leaflets. Um, and if you remember from your anatomy, the Valve leaflets um, and valve cusps are named based on the coronary arteries um, that arise from them. So there's the right, left, and the non-coronary cusps. Um, and this is an example of what a stenotic valve looks like. So this patient, you see two images um, in systole, uh, and then um, slightly uh, later in systole, uh, a patient with stenotic valve. And what we're looking at is the fact that this valve, not only is it calcified, but also just doesn't open up as much as that normal valve that we saw before. Um, this is the problem in patients with aortic stenosis, so you get a restricted opening of the valve itself, and this leads to all the cardiac downstream cardiac uh, problems uh, for these patients due to the pressure load on the left ventricle. So uh, in TAVR, it's really important to know the anatomy um, of the aortic root because this is really where we're doing all these various measurements for the TAVR procedure. Um, and the aortic root is the area between the left ventricular outflow tract, that's the um, part labeled LVOT here on the image, and the sinotubular junction. Um, and it's the uh, basically the area of transition from the sinuses to the tubular aorta, which contains the aortic valve. Um, and it's important to know that the annulus basically is, uh, excuse me, uh, the annulus is basically where the uh, aortic valve leaflets attach to the left ventricular outflow tract, and the sinuses are that part that bulges out where it's just above the level of the aortic valve leaflets and where the coronary arteries arise from. And both the annulus and the sinuses are important pieces of anatomy where we need to perform measurements for pre-transcatheter aortic valve planning. So I'm just going to uh, provide a stack of images here um, through this region um, from some reformats that we performed uh, in the short axis plane uh, just to give a sense of the anatomy of this region. So starting up high at the sinotubular junction, usually you get this nice round uh, appearance. You see we're above the origin of the right coronary artery, and as we step forward, we get into the sinuses. You see the left coronary artery origin there posteriorly at about the 5 o'clock position. Um, and then a little bit lower, we're right at the level of the sinuses. This is kind of the midpoint of the sinuses of Alsalva, where you, the sinuses are at their largest. Um, and we do some measurements here, which we'll touch on later. Um, and then we get uh, just below the sinuses, we get this nice picture here, where we actually see portions of the aortic valve leaflets. And, and what you see here is you see that they're nice and symmetric in size. Um, when you're setting up your planes for TAVR measurements, this is really the key thing that you need to do. Um, you need to make sure that the valve leaflet sizes are symmetric as you scroll downward to find the annulus. Um, and so the annular plane is going to be defined by the point uh, where those valve leaflets attach to the LV outflow tract and basically where, where they disappear from view as you're scrolling in the short axis plane. And that's right there. So this is the aortic annulus right below the attachment sites of the uh, valve leaflets themselves. Um, and like I said, when you see them nice and symmetric uh, on your image, they should all disappear at once. And then the slice just below where they disappear, that's your annulus. And that's where you do the measurements that are critical for uh, transcatheter aortic valve sizing. So there's been a lot of work done over the years to try and determine when one should measure, uh, when in the cardiac cycle one should measure the annulus. Uh, for transcatheter aortic valve sizing. And the concept here is that ideally you'd want to measure when the annulus is the biggest because, again, um, we are worried more about putting in a, a valve that's too small, not so much a valve that's too big. And so ideally you want to have the largest diameter possible. Um, and so in the cardiac cycle, it turns out that people did the painstaking work to look at the size of the annulus and how it changes over time. Uh, across the cardiac cycle, and sure enough, they found that systole is where you get the largest annular measurements. Um, you can look from this image taken from the literature that, that there's quite a, a uh, the, the error bars here are quite wide and the variations um, fairly substantial. So even though systole may technically be the widest diameter, really, um, there's not a huge difference between systole and diastole if you have to use diastole in a pinch.
Um, <clears throat> when to measure the sinuses of Alsalva, so the areas above the, the annulus, that's a little bit more of a personal preference. Um, some of the manufacturers uh, prefer, prefer if you measure those measurements in diastole. Other, uh, others don't really care. Um, so some, some uh, institutions will use uh, systolic measurements for everything, both the sinus measurements as well as the annulus measurements. However, we at, uh, at Hopkins, we're using um, systolic measurements for the annulus and diastolic measurements for the sinuses. And these are the, the, this is the data that we provide. We provide maximum and minimum diameters of the annulus as well as perimeter and area measurements. And these are the pieces of information that are used to decide on the size of the valve uh, that is uh, used in the patient. Um, here's just an example of sort of a smattering of different annuli. Um, not uncommon to see chunks of calcium within the annulus in these patients um, and these um, uh, generally, we sort of draw a line when we're measuring the perimeter. We bisect the calcium in half. Um, and the annulus can vary quite a bit in size from patient to patient and also in the degree of sort of uh, roundness versus more uh, elliptical shape. Um, sinuses of Alsalva. So the annulus is very important for sizing of the device itself. The sinuses of Alsalva are really important to measure to avoid problems. And the main problem you worry about is that you're going to push these diseased leaflets into the sinuses, and the sinuses are not going to be large enough to accommodate those diseased leaflets with calcium, and they may result in coronary obstruction. And here's an example from the literature of what this could look like. This is um, an image of somebody who had pre- and post-taver uh, acquisition, and you see this big hunk of calcium that's displaced into the space of this non-coronary uh, cusp. And so this is fine because there's no coronary artery arising there, but if this happened in the right or the left cusp, then that could present a problem for this patient. Um, so this is an example of what we provide as far as uh, annular measurements. So in the upper right-hand corner, there's annular diameters. We take a cusp to commissure measurement and average the three. And then the bottom right-hand side are measurements of the annular, excuse me, the um, I think I said annular, I meant sinus, sinus diameters of upper right bottom right sinus heights um, and so we take a measurement from the level of the annulus or where you see the attachment site of the um, valve leaflet all the way up to the sinotubular junction again you average the three um, and as long as they're above um, a certain safety threshold um, which is uh, provided from the manufacturer then um, you can feel safe that there's enough room to put the uh, the device uh, we also provide an angle um, and the size of the ascending aorta, um, the size of the ascending aorta can come into play for these um, patients with core valves because the core valve has to sit into the ascending aorta superiorly. And if it's too big, it may not actually uh, set in uh, the right way. The struts may not contact the aortic wall. Coronary osteal heights are important because, again, of this risk of uh, coronary artery occlusion by displaced valve leaflets. So you want to measure how high the coronary ostia are. They should be at least 10 millimeter from the annular plane. If not, then they might be at risk for occlusion after device placement. Annular calcification is another thing we assess. Um, we take a sort of a qualitative look at this. Um, this patient, for instance, has kind of a moderate um, to large amount of annular calcification. It turns out that the more annular calcification you have, the more likely a patient is to have rupture uh, at the time of device placement. The sapien valve uses a balloon expandable uh, um, method for placement, whereas the core valve itself is um, the core valve is self-expanding. Um, so the self-expanding core valve may be a little more gentler in, in setting of a lot of calcium that may um, put a patient at a higher risk of rupture. So in that setting, the cardiologist may choose to go with the core valve rather than the sapien valve if you tell them that there's a lot of annular calcification. This type of calcification you see here, um, this is called the aortomitral continuity, this piece of anatomy right between the aortic valve and mitral valve, and that, that calcium is also associated with a higher risk of rupture. So we report it if we see it, we just say, you know, there's a lot of aortomitral continuity calcification here, you know, be careful basically. Bicuspid valves are interesting. So it turns out if you see a bicuspid valve, um, then you should report it because um, not because the patients won't get the valve replaced, but rather that um, they tend to do a little worse after the procedure than normal pa patients with a tricuspid valve. So um, it's good to obviously have that discussion with the patient and temper expectations a little bit. Um, also, if the patients are involved in a clinical trial, a lot of times they will be excluded um, uh, if they have a bicuspid valve. 
Uh, here's just an example of a couple variants of bicuspid valves that you may run into. The more common sort of simple uh, uh, variant is on the right hand side. That's where you have two discrete valve leaflets. Very easy to say this is a bicuspid valve, a no-brainer. Um, that's the what we think of when we think of bicuspid valve, but actually the image on the left shows you what's actually the more common presentation of a bicuspid valve, which is a patient who has fusion of two valve leaflets, typically the right and the left, um, with a ridge in between called a raffe. And so that patient has a bicuspid valve as well, right? You have you don't have a complete opening of the the um, the valve orifice, and you have this fish mouth appearance but a little tougher to diagnose unless you have cine imaging to help you. So this is just a summary slide of all the different measurements that we provide when we do our transcatheter valve evaluation. And this is something that you have to have a discussion with your local cardiologist and surgeon about what they need, but these are pretty typical. Um, <clears throat> other things that we look for when we're doing our transcatheter valve assessment, we look for thrombus in the left atrial appendage. These patients frequently have dilated and dysfunctional left atria because of, um, because of their um, stiff uh, ventricles uh, due to their years of um, basically uh, dealing with aortic stenosis. This patient has um, a thrombus here. You see um, on the CT angiogram image in the middle, you can see this filling defect. I also want to point out the um, lack of filling of the tip of the left atrial appendage that you see on that middle image that actually resolves on the delayed image. Um, so that is not a thrombus, but that's just an area where you have an artifact due to slow flow of contrast in the left atrial appendage. So we would not call that thrombus, but rather what you want to look for is these filling defects that are surrounded by contrast like the more uh, posterior uh, abnormality you see there that persists on the delayed image. Um, so now I just want to talk about how we do vascular access. So we talked a little bit about analysis of the... Um, uh, of the aortic root region. Now let's talk about vascular access analysis. Okay. First, we provide an overall assessment. So you want to look at the degree of aortic calcification. You want to look at the cabbage graphs like we talked about. Look for any sort of risky features such as aneurysms or dissections. And then we do a, sort of a piece-by-piece -piece evaluation of the vessels, looking at the different segments and assessing their diameter, tortuosity, and calcification. We call it, we, uh, when we do our generic sort of general overview of the aorta, we look at the severity. This is very much a qualitative assessment, and we give a kind of gestalt of the severity of the aortic calcification from none to severe and porcelain aorta. And here's an example of uh, some cases that we would consider you know, mild, moderate, and severe. Um, <clears throat> when you're actually looking at the vessels themselves and doing segmental measurements of the vessels, we talk about severity of vessel calcification, and some authors have proposed using the degree of circumferentiality of calcification to help you define whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. So this is an example, moderate being you know greater than 50% uh, circumferential calcification, uh, up to 75%, and, and severe being over 75% to basically complete uh, circumferential calcification. Here's just an example of a case we have, a porcelain aorta. You can see they're really extensive uh, calcification. This patient would be a terrible candidate for aortic uh, open aortic valve surgery, and so this is a great candidate for TAVR in theory. Um, another patient with a really, really extensive calcification, again, not going to be a great candidate for open surgery. Cabbage grass we talked about as well as a reason, uh, something to keep, pay attention to, um, something that can help tip the balance towards TAVR away from surgery. Um, you want to tell the surgeons basically if they have any grafts, patients have any grafts that are at risk. And they're at risk if they're less than a centimeter to a centimeter and a half deep to the sternum in the midline where that basically that saw will be uh, placed when they open up the uh, sternum. So here's an example of one of those cases. You can see this, this aorta to, I'm not even sure where it's going, but this aorta graft um, is really, really close to the uh, sternum there posteriorly, basically stuck up against the back of the sternum. And so if you were to open up that sternum again, that, that vessel would certainly be at risk for injury. What about other stuff? We often see these patients, again, are really are, are often quite uh, elderly, and they have a lot of atherosclerotic disease. So we often see aneurysms, dissections, nasty ulcerated plaque. There are no real guidelines on what to do with this stuff. Um, so if you see them, you certainly mention it um, and let the cardiologist or surgeon know. Um, and they may avoid areas that have this sort of nasty plaque 
Um, but again, you know, if the patient's really, really sick, then they probably just go ahead and do it and, and sort of uh, cross your fingers and hope for the best uh, result possible. Um, now, so besides, after this, you do sort of the overall assessment of the aorta. Um, what we usually do is then basically drill down to uh, individual vessel segments and provide vessel diameter measurements. And it's important to know that these measurements really need to be high quality, short axis measurements that are perpendicular to the vessel wall. Um, generally, almost everybody at this point is using 3D imaging platform to create curve planar images that allow you to obtain these short axis measurements. And you're going to get them at multiple levels, then again, multiple segments of the vascular anatomy. Um, you want to find basically the minimal diameter at the abdominal aortic level, the iliac artery level, both common and external, and the femoral artery level. And <clears throat> the bottom line is if it's too small, then they're not going to put in the, uh, the device because they're worried that they uh, might rupture that vessel. So vascular damage in the old days was much more common. Um, the older... Uh, initial sort of devices that came out were, were larger with larger sheaths and now over time they've been able to streamline these devices and so the the risk of vascular injury has gotten quite a bit lower um, just image on the right of a patient who had big pseudoaneurysms after uh, device placement um, other complications you look for dissection rupture uh, pseudoaneurysm hematoma anything basically that, that can happen from sort of any iatrogenic injury you can get from vascular access um, there's this term you might hear, it's out there in the literature called sheath to femoral artery diameter ratio. It's a very, very simple concept, which is basically that you take the size of your sheath, the outer diameter of your sheath, you take the outer di or the diameter of your vessel, and you take the ratio of the two. If the sheath is bigger than the, the artery, i.e. the ratio is over 1 or 1 1.05 in this case, then that's a risky situation. You don't want your sheath to be bigger than your vessel, and so you shouldn't really do that. Use that vessel for access. Um, this is a, a paper from 2014 from the literature talking about all the different sizes uh, that are needed for vascular access using some of the more recent uh, devices. Um, this is uh, the core valve and the sapien, and basically the general rule of thumb is you want to have a vessel diameter of 6 millimeters or more um, to, to be able to, do, to place a, a, a TAVR valve. Here's just a, a visual example of what we do. We um, uh, use our software to oops, obtain a curve planar um, uh, segmentation of the vessel. And we get right there. And then we do a short axis evaluation and provide uh, minimal luminal diameters. A lot of the software now will do this for you automatically. They'll find the minimal diameter you know, automatically by segmenting out the vessel, vessel wall. That's sort of variably successful, I found, depending on how much calcium a patient has. And a lot of times we go with this sort of eyeballing technique where we just scroll down, up and down the vessel and just find the minimal diameter ourselves manually. Um, same thing for the subclavians. Um, we do subclavian analysis. We really only provide subclavian measurements if we need to because we know that the iliac route, if, it's, uh, if it looks good, then, then there's no need to go for the subclavian. Um, but if needed, it's there. Um, and easy enough to provide the measurements. Just an example here of a case we had with very poor iliofemoral access. Um, important to note here that you have a very discrete lesion, and so you might want to let your, uh, let your uh, colleagues know this because this is a patient who, who may be able to get a stent perhaps, um, and that's um, certainly a, a type of approach that can be done where you stent a lesion, and then once the stent's in place, you can insert your, your sheath. Another example, now this patient probably wouldn't uh, be a great candidate for stenting. You can see there's extensive calcification both on the left and the right side. Um, it's going to be a lot harder to, to really successfully stent this patient due to all of the severe disease. So this may be somebody who needs to go subclavian or some other access route. Um, we also, in addition to measurements, we provided a, a assessment of vessel tortuosity. Um, from mild to moderate to severe, and basically here we're going off of how, what's the angle that the vessel passes through. If you look at the severe, all the way on the right, the vessel is taking about a 180 degree kind of hairpin turn, um, and in the moderate category is more around kind of like a 90 degree bend, and then mild is less than that. So uh, TAVR complications are fairly well documented. Um, this is an evolving story, so um, devices have been changing. Um, and improving um, over time, and so many of these complications have been on the decline. Uh, the only exception I would say here is that um, 
Heart block is still a very common complication, um, although I think probably a little lower in, uh, um, prevalence than there used to be. Um, still quite common in these patients. Um, the uh, patients are often, again, elderly, and they have sort of disease of their conduction system to begin with. And then when you put the device in, um, it puts pressure on the, uh, on the conduction system um, and basically causes a mechanical injury that can lead to heart block. Um, other complications that can happen actually during the procedure itself, um, you can have rupture of the annulus. We talked about that as a problem that can be associated with a heavily calcified annulus. So the annulus is very stiff. You're trying to put a stent in that very stiff annulus, and you may get actual frank rupture. Uh, fortunately, a very rare complication. Valve migration would be basically you try to put the valve in one spot, and it just doesn't quite fit and keeps moving, and, and there are certainly case reports of valves that eject into the ascending aorta or arch or beyond. Um, obviously, that's not an ideal uh, situation. Uh, coronary occlusion is kind of the dreaded thing that we talked about before, so that's why we do our measurements of the coronary arteries, and you don't you want to make sure you avoid uh, the valve, the device itself, covering up the coronary arteries and blocking uh, coronary artery flow, and um, uh, that certainly can, can lead to very poor outcomes. Um, there are also vascular access-related complications, which, which we talked about. Traditionally, they had been quoted as around 20%, but certainly now with the smaller profile sheaths, that's come down quite a lot. Annular rupture, just to touch on, um, again, this is about 1%, probably less than that, of TAVR cases. Um, you see it a little bit more with the balloon expanded valves, the sapien valves, um, and again, higher risk if the annulus is small or calcified. Um, and this is just an example from the literature. We don't have one um, uh, here, but this is a, a picture of a, a pseudoaneurysm related to basically a contained rupture of the annulus in this patient who had a sapien valve. This is an image from the literature as well of somebody who had coronary occlusion. You can see on the left-hand image, this is uh, intraoperatively. The device has been placed, and they're performing an injection uh, above the level of the valve, so you should see filling here of the left main coronary artery and LED, which you do not, and that is because they've been blocked by this uh, valve. Um, and this is the post-mortem image showing the um, black arrow shows the ostium for the left main, and then the white arrow shows the edge of the valve, which is covering that up. Uh, this is an example from uh, actually a, a talk given back at the NASCI annual meeting a couple years ago um, showing the, one of the bad things that can happen if your sheath uh, to femoral artery ratio, which we talked about before, is too big. So if your sheath is too big for your vessel, you can end up with this situation here where you actually pull, pull the vessel out with the sheath. Um, obviously, this, this leads to rupture and big problems, so the patients need to be rushed off to vascular surgery. Pseudoaneurysms can happen with any type of vascular access, um, so that's not uncommon uh, with any type of endovascular repairs, whether it be for abdominal aortic aneurysm or for TAVR. And AV fistula as well, certainly something that we can run into. So uh, that, that sums up, the, that's basically the end of a talk. Um, so this last little bit um, uh, finished up for you. And um, so just to, just to recap, so we had a three-part uh, review here. Um, in the first part, we talked about how aortic stenosis is quite common and TAVR is a, a booming field and probably coming soon to, to a hospital near you, uh, if not there already. The CT is the standard of care for pre-TAVR planning, and we optimize our CT protocols to perform a gated cardiac evaluation of the heart and CT angiogram uh, with runoff to the pelvis. Um, our analysis really focuses on these measurements to A, size the device, um, and B, uh, determine where to use or where you can um, obtain vascular access, and then C, identify any risky features um, such as annular calcifications, et cetera. And then finally, in this last part, we talked about post TAVR complications, um, which are uncommon, but we can see them occasionally at CT, particularly vascular injuries, so we want to be on the lookout for those. Um, and just some references uh, in case you want to go back and do a little bit more reading. And thanks a lot for your attention.